You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And this week, we're playing a best of collection of some of our favorite segments. We hope you enjoy it. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday. Happy, Happy Saturday. Saturday. Haley, you beat me to the punch. Sorry. <laughs> you stole my thunder. <laughs> I'm just so excited about tulip time. I want to start talking about the tulips. You just want to, but but I just have a thing that chase. I do, and, and that thing right, yeah. is what gets me going and, and gets the whole thing. You just ruined your mojo? You did. You killed my mojo. The whole <laughs> show is going to stink now. Mojo Jojo. Yeah. So anyway, whatever we were saying, it's tulip time. I don't even know where we're going anymore. It's tulip time. We're this is my first tulip time. It's Haley's first tulip time. I'm we're excited for the carnival part. The elephant ears. Yeah. The I'm not excited for the restraint of not picking the tulips. Right, because that's a thing for you. Yeah, I really like picking flowers, and I know that I'm not allowed to. You know why? Why do you know? Because I thought about it. And who told you not to? I had the instinct first that it was a bad idea. I said, well, these Holland people, they might not like me picking the flowers. <laughs> and so I came in and said, can I pick the flowers? You said, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I have been raised... With, I mean, the the fear has been driven into me that mm-hmm. you don't do that. I don't even know what happens. Well, I don't think it's pretty. It's similar to the Ottoman Empire that we're going to talk about. W- w- okay, so yes, yeah. so we decided to celebrate tulip time by throwing a spotlight on tulips, tulip bulbs, their history, and all of that. Mm-hmm. And it was Haley's idea, and you wanted to start with the origins of it. Yeah. So we're going to just jump straight into the show. We got other good stuff coming. Don't worry about it. She can't have killed my mojo bad enough because I am full of mojo. <laughs> So the little bit you did, it's not going to hurt the rest of the good. show. I'm Trust so me, glad. It's good. But the origins, they started in such a weird place. They were a wildflower. They grew in Central Asia, in Persia, around 1080 is the earliest that we know they were mm-hmm. around. Um, but yeah, just grown on the side of the road, or well, I guess maybe not road, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a wildflower. Just being cute all on their own. Never would have pictured that. I always pictured the pristine fields. Yeah, because we know tulips as being cultivated yeah. flowers. So I thought that was really interesting. And then they transitioned from there. To Turkey. Right. Yeah, the Turks fell in love with the tulip, and they were the ones that really started cultivating it as this pristine flower that it is today. And that was in like the 16th century Ottoman Empire. The Sultan was so obsessed with tulips that if you tried to take tulips outside of the capital, you were punished by exile. I wonder what he did if you picked them. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe that's where we got our ideas for the rules. I don't think it's far off. It seems like <laughs> tulips inspire that kind of craziness. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it just keeps going. Well, so because then yeah. they finally actually get taken out of Turkey. Um, there was a guy who had a friend that was working in Turkey at the time. He came back to Vienna. About what time is this? Um, this is in like the 1600s. Okay. Early 1500s, I guess. All right. Um, but he gets a hold of a tulip and then he actually starts cultivating it in... Leiden, Netherlands, Mm -hmm. because he's working at essentially the botanical gardens there. Mm -hmm. But that's where he started cultivating these tulips. For medicinal purposes, they found out that it actually is good for skin. It's also a diuretic, an antiseptic. Don't try it at home because you don't know. You might have an allergy to it. Yeah, my dad (laughs) built a a little fort out of poison sumac when he was little. Hmm. And we have great photos where we got photos from the day he built it. Uh And then the day after when he swelled up like a balloon. Wow. So we don't want that with tulips. So don't go rubbing them all over your face. Don't do that. But eventually, I don't know exactly how it caught on as a mania, but tulips were the thing in the Netherlands once this guy started cultivating them. And it took off so much that they were worth more than a house at right, the some actual, points. Like a single bulb right. could be worth more than a house. They became a collector's item. They traded them as currency, essentially, because they were so valuable. And all of these really rare breeds of tulips were even more valuable. So it was this like high society way of... it's. Like art collecting. It's very strange to think of it being that valuable. Mm -hmm. But yet, what I found, it made them even more valuable than that. Yes, life-saving. Life-saving, actually. In World War II, they were actually eaten. Basically, the winter of 1944 to 1945, German troops were still occupying the Netherlands. And the railway workers and the Dutch government in exile 
kind of worked together, collaborated to come up with a scheme, basically, or whatever, a plan to have a railroad strike. And that would prevent the German troops from sure. being transported all okay. over the place. That was the idea, to slow it down. Mm-hmm. Well, Stand Germany in their way. didn't like that, of course. of course. So they halted supplies into the Western Netherlands. Now, to make things worse, right around that time, December of 1944, cold weather sets in that lasts several months. Canals freeze over, transportation and escape becomes impossible. Yikes, and there's no food. No food. You've got all of this going on. Well, the combination of harsh, prolonged winter and a limited food supply sends the country into a severe famine, and it's actually known as the hunger winter. The hunger. Yeah, there's a there's a Dutch word for it that I couldn't say, but okay. the translation is the hunger winter. Starvation becomes extremely common, and over 4.5 million people are affected. More than 22,000 die. Jeez. Enter an unlikely hero, the tulip bulb. See, the war had slowed down all the farming and the growing of them. So they weren't yeah, being no one planted. Yeah, no cares about yeah. tulips when there's well, a war. And, and the, the, the young men were gone. Right. So there's nobody to plant the tulips. And so we've got barns and barns full of them. They're rotting. They're starting to dehydrate and all of those things. But they're still potentially edible. Somewhere, somebody looked at them and said, you know what? It looks kinda, kind of like an onion. looks like an onion. Kind of looks like a potato, comes out of the ground. Maybe we can eat it. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that part worked, but I do know that at one point that winter, the Dutch government, actually the Office of Food Supply, published a guide suggesting that tulip bulbs are a food source and explained how to prepare them and even offered a few recipes for the housewives who are trying to wow. crank out something delicious. I would love delicious. to see this cookbook. I know. I, I can't imagine. Makes me kind of want to try a tulip bulb, but I also, well, you said. Yeah, here's the thing. They have almost no nutritional value, so right. you're not getting much out of it. But they also contain glycoside, which is bad. potentially poisonous. <laughs> so there <laughs> are I concerns. Try right. it. But the Dutch had no choice at that point. So properly preparing them. You know, removing the parts that contain the glycoside, they cooked them and ate them like potatoes. And even more commonly, they milled the bulbs to make a sort of flour that they used for bread. Mm -hmm. Now, eventually in 1945, the Allies started dropping supplies back in. Okay, so they didn't need them as much. The emergency kind of faded and the tulip bulbs didn't need to be eaten anymore. But they did save the day over that time period, that gap. That's pretty cool, actually. Right. They, it's estimated that about 140 million bulbs were eaten throughout that time. Holy cow. <laughs> now, what makes this really interesting, and I'll go really fast, is what came out of it medically speaking. See, at this point, a doctor in the Netherlands, Dr. Willem Carroll Dick, works at Juliana Children's Hospital in the city of The Hague. All right. Okay. He's got a large number of children patients with celiac disease. Hmm. And at that point, there was no real consensus as to the causes of celiac disease. Dr. Dick, though, believed that wheat was a main offender, but he didn't have any proof. So when the hunger winter hits, starving conditions begin to impact all of his patients. Right. And he notices that even with low food rations. They're improving. Yes. His celiac patients are. Everybody else is degrading. Right. These are improving, these patients. And when they bring in the, the bread made with tulip flour... They all improved dramatically. In fact, I believe I read that the uh, mortality rate of the celiac patients in his hospital went from 35% to nearly zero. Whoa. The, all because they were eating this bread Gluten-free without bread. any wheat in it. <laughs> and after the war, uh, Dr. Dick spends a number of years studying all of this. And in 1950, publishes his findings that wheat and rye flour aggravate celiac symptoms. And he also was able to discount the theory that complex carbohydrates were the cause. So with the help of all these other doctors and researchers and this hunger winter mm-hmm. and, the and the tulip flour, he's able to pinpoint gluten is the ultimate culprit in the whole thing. Wow. And all kinds of good things happen because of it. So thank you, <laughs> tulips. Now, all right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about touch-up painting, why the process can be tricky sometimes, and more importantly, what you need to do to get the best results possible every single time. All of that's coming up next. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And this week, we're playing a best of collection of some of our favorite segments. We hope you enjoy it. Well, Haley, there's never a dull moment, is there? We are in a hot little studio, and we've got our our one connection 
to Sanity is our fan. Mm-hmm. And you have a little remote I have for a it. little, a beautiful little remote that I love because I don't have to get out of my chair to turn the fan on. I just click, well, you know how remotes work. I don't have to go into Hopefully. a yeah. long story. But <laughs> in the break, I went to set my remote down. And you just went, bloop, right in your coffee cup. Right into my coffee cup. And then I was shaking out the coffee and then I opened it up to get the coffee out of the battery compartment. And for some reason... Your first instinct was, I'll just drink the coffee out of the battery I section. I know, I know. <laughs> I wasn't thinking. There was chewies in there, the little gummies. I don't know why I do half of what I do. My children are embarrassed. You're embarrassed to even be a part of this. Yep. And now I've shared it with everybody. I'm just thinking, yeah, so many thoughts. All right, let's go on to the topic at hand. We had somebody email us about touch-up paint. And the scenario that happened was this. She got a Benjamin Moore sample pint. In yeah. her color. So the house was painted maybe four years ago, and she came in for touch-up paint, didn't have any of the original, and got a sample pint in the color, right? Now, that does make some sense. I can sure. see where... Yeah, it's a small you know, amount of paint, would, yeah. and she knows the color, so it's Definitely fine. Definitely seems like a good solution. She went home to touch up the spots and was disappointed that everything showed. She wondered what went wrong and then how to fix it. Now, we're going to deal with the whole sample pint thing and why that didn't work, in the second part of this segment. But right off the bat, there's a number of reasons why touch-ups can go poorly or stand out. And usually the failure is due to one or a combination of the following. Yeah, the first part is going to be application. If you've got a bunch of spots that need to be touched up on a single wall, even though it sounds like more work, it's honestly better to just paint corner to corner. There's way less of a chance that you're going to see any of those touch-up spots because our eye is not going to carry over the corner. There's already a color shift regardless, so it's not going to know that that's not exact. Right. We'd always recommend, you know, the ideal way to get your best results is to paint a larger area Mm -hmm. and find breaking points. Corner to corner is ideal. Now, not everybody wants to jump into that. We get that. But still look for bigger breaking points because, as Haley mentioned, we, our eye isn't going to carry all of those differences, and it will just blend away. Exactly. Looks better. You get better results. We all know what it looks like when you touch up the little silver dollar size spots on the wall and you see them. Well, Very frustrating. Yeah, people always think that, oh, I just have a small touch-up to do. It's going to be really easy, and it's actually the hardest touch-up to do are the really tiny ones. Yeah, so if you can do a bigger section, better results. Now, let's say you can't or you're not going to. The next thing you need to think about is that when you do this touch-up, you've got to use the same tool that the paint was originally applied with. Exactly. If you rolled paint onto the wall, you want to use that exact same roller, ideally, to roll on the touch-up, which doesn't sound like work that we want to do again, because now it's a whole thing. we got to get out a tray, and that's a mess. Roller frame, roller covers, and that's where the Wooster Jumbo Coater system is a great system. You know, the whole Worcester roller system is a great way to go because if you buy the normal size roller covers, the 9 inches, contractors will use the 18 inch covers. Worcester makes a jumbo coater, which is a small coater. Funny mm-hmm. name. I don't know why they yeah. went with that, but jumbo in this case actually means super little. Yeah, mini. So, yeah, a mini roller cover. And all of these mini roller covers, they've got a full range of them, and they all match their larger counterparts. Exactly. And the fabric used, the nap used, all of it will match. So it will be flawless. You won't see the difference between the two. So it's a great system to use just for regular painting. If you have to get into tight corners, use this jumbo coater system in cooperation with the Worcester larger, you know, regular rollers. Right. And you're going to have no problems at all. You'll be able to switch back and forth and see no difference. And if you don't know what kind of roller cover you use, you know, just use a roller cover that's appropriate for the job. The worst thing you could do, though, is use a brush on a wall that was rolled out because that texture from the brush is going to make the paint look like a different color. That texture is going to reflect in a different way, and it's amazing how much of a difference that makes. Right. So use the same tool and keep those jumbo coders in mind. Now, let's say that you've got a super small spot. And you don't even want to get a jumbo coater out to roll that area. Like, you know, the whole like from... tiny little nail hole. Exactly that. What do you do? Well, there's a great system that I ran into. Somebody shared that with me. Somebody who's been in paint for years said one of the things they would always recommend to their customers is to get a Q-tip. And basically, you just get the paint on the end of the Q-tip and use it as a little tiny mini roller. It's like a roller for Barbies. It is. And it really <laughs> works well. It gives enough of the simulation of that texture. Yeah. To have it blend away, I've tried it a bunch of times. Works really well. Really nice for super simple, quick touch-ups. Yeah, it's smart. 
All right, so make sure you're applying with the right tool. The third thing that you want to do is apply light coats and feather them all out. Don't try to make a single application cover and hide. Your paints right. can be too thick. It could be too shiny in that regard. It could even run down the wall a little bit. Well, and when we say feather it out, we mean you're applying less and less paint to blend with the rest of the wall. So as you work out from that single spot, it's just getting less paint the further you go out. The fourth thing when it comes to application is to be patient. You know, paint changes as it dries. Yeah, wet paint is not going to match your wall. So don't rush into a store because you just applied touch up and it doesn't match. I've had people do that. Mm -hmm. I've almost been that person, but I told myself, no, it's going to darken over time. And yeah, you don't want to rush out, get new paint, come back home and find that what you had blended right in. Give it time, let it dry. All right, so those are application issues. Another reason touch-ups go awry is that we use the wrong paint. We've got to get the exact paint that we had in the same finish and the same exact color to make this work. Exactly, which is why the sample pint did not work for that touch-up, because you did not paint your walls with a sample pint. You painted it, let's say, with the Benjamin Moore's Regal Select in eggshell. And so the sample pint is an eggshell, so it seems like it would work, but actually paint is going to vary in sheen from product to product line. Even though they both say eggshell, it's not the exact same eggshell. And then, of course, sheen dies a little bit over time, too, which makes it really hard when you're touching up paint that's extremely old, because it's flattened out, and so now, even if you go down to the basement and you get the original paint out of the original can, it might look slightly shinier when you repaint because it's been aged for so long. Well, and color changes as it sits on the walls. Right. You know, our room depends on how it's used, but normally, you know, it's going to pick up surface contaminants. The color is going to be dulled a little bit, darkened a little bit over time. And so new paint can be shinier. It can be a little lighter in color, even if it all comes, like you said, from the original can. So with all of that said, how in the world do you get good results with touch-ups? Well, first, that's where that corner-to-corner -corner thing that we mentioned in the very beginning mm -hmm. really comes out and helps a lot. If you go corner-to-corner, -corner, even if the color is slightly different, even if the sheen is a little different, you're not going to see it. Secondly, keep good notes. Yeah, my grandpa left really great paint notes in the basement. He labeled every can with the date that he bought it, the color that was used. All of the information was right there on the can, and it said where it went in the house because paints may look really similar and it's not exactly the same color. Sometimes people will make note cards if you go that route, if that's the way you like to go. Ask in the store and we can print an extra sticker for you with all of the pertinent information and get that on there. Sometimes now people will take photos. Yeah, and people sometimes will take pictures of the lid of the can, which doesn't actually have as much information as you think it does for us. So we prefer, again, ask what information we need so that you're taking a picture of the right part of the can so that we have the information later on when you come in that you're not frustrated. Exactly. Third, if the original paint isn't a close match anymore, which is possible, we can always custom match something. Be aware of that. But the big thing to remember here is that we need to see something in order to match it. And sometimes this means you've got to get creative. You've got to look for face plates, vent covers, anything with the paint on it that can be easily removed and brought in. Exactly. I've had people remove entire strips of trim into the store because, I mean, we just need a target. And it's doesn't have to be giant. Just a quarter size really is all we need to get a match of that paint. But the bigger the sample, the better. Right. So by all means, if you're stuck in that situation, give us a call ahead of time and we can kind of walk you through what's the best way to help you get your color. Touch-ups can be pulled off and we're not trying to make it sound like the impossible dream. Yeah. It certainly can be done. <laughs> it's just you've got to know a few things going in in order to get those great results. Exactly. Now, all right, we're going to take a break. And for the Grand Rapids listeners, you'll get news and weather and all of that good stuff. Detroit listeners, you're going to get a Repco Light Rewind. And then when we're all back together, we're going to get one of my favorite segments of all time, a deep dive look at ladders and some of the folklore that surrounds them. It's a lot of fun, believe me. So stick around. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And this week, we're playing a best of collection of some of our favorite segments. We hope you enjoy it. Well, Haley, there are all kinds of tools that we take for granted. We don't even think about where they came from. We just use them. And mm -hmm. most of the time, if you're children, you don't even put them back where they belong. <laughs> you just use them and leave them there and never give a second thought to it. Now, we have talked about a bunch of them before. We've talked about hammers and saws and duct tape. And we've dug into the interesting history behind them. And I came up with another one. You did. It's I was a, excited about it. It's a really good one. And even though I thought it was a really lousy idea at the beginning, mm -hmm. I didn't. I'm joking. <laughs> 
But I wasn't wowed by it. Because it sounds really ordinary because we take it for granted. It's the latter. Something we need and depend on all the time. And the shorter you are, the more you need it. Yeah, you really need them, Dan. I do. So you, you should really appreciate the latter. <laughs> you are not any taller. No, I know. Yeah. We both <laughs> need them and reaching wands, but we'll get those in another episode. But, but these have been around since 10,000 BC. At least. At that's, least. That's, that's the first recorded history. Exactly. We've got, what, art on a cave. The spider caves in Valencia, Spain shows a picture of... Of somebody climbing up with their, they're up to their elbow in a beehive harvesting honey. Yeah, right? we think that's what the article said. We think they were harvesting honey. What else would they have been doing <laughs> yeah. with, with their, their arm in a beehive? Right. It better be harvesting <laughs> honey. But either way, that, that particular picture shows a ladder being used. Now it's kind of a rope ladder. Mm-hmm. They think it was probably made out of grass or something like that. But it's a ladder in concept. And then we know that they had wood ladders that they used in ancient Egypt uh, because that's how they built the pyramids and the tombs. So they've been around for a really long time and they haven't really changed much since the Egyptians were using them in that way. Right. The the Egyptian uh, ladders that, that we talk about, basically, that's the modern ladder look for the most part. Mm-hmm. And that's the way it was for a very long time. And we know that the pharaohs and all those, they were using them in Egypt, but we know that they became more common shortly after that. And people everywhere started using them. And we know that because of a very interesting reference. There's a game that we're all familiar with. (laughs) Shoots and ladders. Shoots and ladders. How old is that? We all figure it's probably from the 40s or something like that. It goes back where? To the second or third century BC. BC. In India. It was snakes and ladders originally. I, I don't love this game. I'll be honest. It's a little harsh, and maybe that's why. Wait, whoa. <laughs> you have a hard time with shoots and ladders? That's harsh? That I guess game the kids definitely do made lot. me cry. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't huh. a fun one. I mean, no. it's fun, but it's, I don't know. Well, it's old. Maybe that's the problem. I think you know, so. How it is with old things. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, shoots and ladders. It's it's a it's a game that goes back, you said, second century BC. Yeah. It was already something in pop culture at that point. Yeah. And it didn't really change much until about 1862 when Henry H. Balsley invented the folding ladder, the folding step ladder. Now there were step ladders just prior to that. There's there's evidence of that, but he holds the patent for the folding step ladder. He basically threw two ladders together and put a hinge on it and suddenly you've got something that's incredibly easy to store. It's portable and he also changed the the steps, right. the rungs. Hence the step ladder cuz now they're flat and easy to just climb up. Before it was always that round rung. Mhm. So that was a big advancement 1862. Another huge advancement comes in 1867. And it's Henry Marcus Quackenbush. Yeah, I always pause on that last name. a great (laughs) last name, Quackenbush. He invented the extension ladder at the age of 16. Yeah, I wasn't inventing at the age of 16. No, I don't even know if I was driving. All the cool kids were. In fact, pretty much everybody was. I was a late bloomer. (laughs) That's been my thing. If I would ever get a tattoo, which mom says I can't, so I won't. But if I did, it would say late bloomer. I am still peaking. I'm waiting to peak. I like it. Fine wine. Yes, I'm like a fine wine. I'm just aging. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Anyway, Henry Quackenbush, he's 16. He's a mover and a shaker. He's probably got girlfriends. He's probably driving, and he's inventing the extension ladder. Think about that. And think about the fact that we've had two major advancements in the ladder within five years. Up until that point, they were pretty much the same. It's yeah. kind of incredible thousands to think about. And thousands of years, and then boom, all these changes. Yeah. The next big advancement comes about 60-some years later in 1930, yep. and that's the introduction of the aluminum ladder. Yeah, the aluminum extension ladder. And it's because Norwegian firefighters decided they were too tired to lug those heavy wooden extension ladders around. (laughs) Well, you're throwing a lot of shade there. Is that what the kids say now? Yeah. Did I use that correctly? You did. You did. That is like the first time ever. (laughs) Anyway, you're throwing a lot of shade, but extension ladders, wood ladders. they're really heavy. Crazy heavy. I don't move them. I watch other people move them. (laughs) So the Norwegian firefighters kind of were crabbing about that. Hey, this is too much. We're not sure if we want to get to that floor or not. Maybe we can do something different. I'm sure that's not how it went, but 
overall. Well, Sam Corbis took on the job, though, and he creates the first aluminum. Was he from Norway? Where was he from? Corbis. No, he's from the U.S. Oh, he's from the U.S. Yeah. So he takes the job on and comes up with the, the aluminum, aluminum extension ladder. And so that's the first time we see a lightweight ladder being used. And from there, it kind of takes off. Now, all the firefighters want these lightweight aluminum extension ladders and companies are being made just to support these firefighters, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah, the aluminum extension ladder, that's probably what most of us have sitting around. Mm hmm. Easy to lug around, and we can thank Sam Corbis and the Norwegian firefighters for getting that started in the 30s. One other big advancement that kind of happened in about the 80s, 82, I think it was, right. and this was surprising, yeah. it was the attic ladder. You know the little thing that you pull the, pull the rope down in the garage or whatever, and the ladder folds down? I really can't believe it took that long to make that. Yeah, I know. The 80s. I know. A lot of good things happened in the 80s. Hmm. That's well, one of them. That's the history no. But there's some fun stuff we could get into. Or the we could go safety stuff. We could talk about safety stuff or we could talk about... Let's save the safety stuff. We'll do that in a, a future okay. episode. We've so only you just got want a little to do bit fun of time. stuff today. Yeah. All right. And it is fun. It, it is. is fun. It's the superstitious stuff that that's tied with ladders. And we all know, you know, when you think about... There's a handful of things that we think about. And whether you're superstitious or not, you know that there's certain things... That a great big group of people think are yeah. Don't break a mirror. Avoid. Breaking mirrors, black, black hats, hat. uh -huh. Friday the thirteenth. That's always a big sure. one. And walking under ladders. Walking under a ladder. And Haley brought that up when you pitched this topic, and you said, "Why is that a problem?" And of course, as is my way, I said, "Oh, that's simple. It's just." And then I had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized very quickly, I got nothing. I don't have any idea why that's a big <laughs> deal. And so you dug into it yeah. and you found a couple of things. Where does this go back to? Well, no, the superstition is almost as long as they were being used for it was back in ancient Egypt. They decided to put these ladders in the tombs that they were building with the ladders as a way for that person to get to the afterlife. It was going to make it easy for them to get out of the tomb. But if you walked under the ladder, you were kind of interrupting their journey to the afterlife. Oh, so really? that was bad luck. Yeah. So doing that, that was a big deal. And then you mentioned that in uh, later years. Yeah, Christianity. Cre right, because the ladders, they were leaned up against walls at that point in yes. time. And that naturally creates a triangle. A triangle, or at least something very close to a triangle. And of course, the triangle is a, a symbol for the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And walking underneath that ladder was like you, you said the language they used was breaking, breaking the Trinity. Breaking the Holy Trinity. That's a big deal. And that might be why the offense is so great. It's between 7 and 40 years that the bad luck is supposed to last. Right. So that's where some of these superstitions come from. And I'm sure there's more. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. But we decided there's one last important thing that we can't talk about the superstition side of things without giving everybody the answer as to how to avoid it. Because while the superstition is kind of funny to think about where that came from... How to undo it is even oh better. Gosh. So, so we've got good. a number of ways. We've got a couple minutes to go through them. And you're going to want to take notes because, I mean, I don't know how many times I walked under a ladder ever since we started writing this topic down. But anyway, here are some things you can do. First off, it's pretty straightforward. The first one is really easy. If you it, walk under, you walk back out backwards. backwards. Just go in reverse. Right. You can't turn around. Because no. that's going to make it yeah. just as bad. Maybe worse. I don't know. We should consult. Probably worse. But if you walk backwards, you can undo perhaps. And if you make a wish on your way out, maybe that's even better. <laughs> so who knows? But that's the walking backwards one. Now, that's not for everybody because not everybody is that agile. Oh, yeah. Fair. Okay. I would probably fall over trying to walk backwards. So not your thing. Don't worry. We've got you covered. You can always put your thumb between your index and middle finger while walking under the ladder. So basically you're doing the I got your nose thing. Oh, yeah. You know, okay. we do that to little kids. Mm -hmm. If you do the I got your nose thing as you're walking under the ladder, Cancels you're it good out. to go. Wow. All right. And maybe both hands if you're really worried. <laughs> well, if it's a big ladder or if you're really worried, both hands would be great. The other thing you can do is cross your fingers and wait for a dog to come by. <laughs> yeah, you got to wait for the dog. That's really important. If you just cross your fingers and go under the ladder and come out on the other side and uncross them Didn't without seeing anything. the dog, no, nah, you just screwed it all up. Yeah. So you've got to keep them crossed until you see a dog. We're not technically sure what kind of dog. Probably a big one. Bigger's better. Bigger maybe. is better. And, you know, a pure breed is good. If it's mangy, <laughs> maybe keep looking. You know, who knows? 
But maybe let's say finger crossing isn't your thing. If you like spitting, we've got some answers for you because you can get rid of the bad luck by spitting three times through the rungs. I don't know if I would be good at that, actually. Well, you might spit on the rung yeah. and cause a slip hazard for right, somebody. Right, exactly. Okay, well, let's say you don't want to spit through the rungs. One last one you can try is as you're walking through, and this one sounds really good, super uh-huh. solid. I'm sure this one's going to work. As you're walking through, you notice you're under a ladder. Oh, no, what do I do? You spit on your shoe, and then you don't look at it, don't look at the spittle on your shoe until it's dried. So you're going to need a helper. Yeah, well, that's logical. Yeah, just get a little kid mm-hmm. somewhere, have them check out your shoe. If the spittle's dry, you're good to go. That's probably the best one, most effective. I think so, too. We're going to put a link in the show notes so you can check these out. Isn't folklore and superstition fun? <laughs> yeah. Crazy stuff. I love it. Okay, we've got to pause for a few minutes for commercials and whatnot. And when we come back, we'll be joined in the studio by Dan Altina, president of Repcolite, and we'll be talking about painting wood floors. That's all next. Stick around. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And this week, we're playing a best of collection of some of our favorite segments. We hope you enjoy it. There's always projects you can tackle that will make your space feel better. And one that we've never really talked about on the show, but which which will have a huge impact Mm -hmm. on any space, is painting an old wood floor. Exactly. It's such a good way to freshen up a space. It's not a huge investment. It's not like replacing the floors themselves, Mm -hmm. right? And we're talking about floors that maybe they've got water damage. Maybe they really weren't ever meant to be the star of the show. They were meant to have carpet go over them. So they're she not looked at me when super... she said the star of the show. Did you notice that? Yeah, I did notice that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cute. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the odd man out here. Well, Dan, <laughs> we can't all be stars. No, I do know that. <laughs> you can all, like, what? what are the, you can be my entourage. <laughs> That's what uh, I, I consider right. myself. So the floors can't be the star of the show. Just like not everybody here can be the star of the show, <laughs> exactly. right? So they need a little help sometimes. Yes. And, and we should say, you know, if you're going to paint wood floors, you're kind of committing to that. You're not necessarily committing to a color. You can always change that, but you're probably not ever going to go back to wood floors again. It's going to get into the cracks a little bit. Dan, that was your big concern yeah. with the project. Right. But I do love all the options. It goes with any style, colors, has There's a, a lot ton to of impact. A ton yeah. of impact. Easy to change the colors. It's way, you know way simpler than carpet or any of those other exactly. choices. And it's a it's a relatively simple project. A great project to start on if you really haven't done a ton of painting. Now, before we get into all the cool possibilities and colors and designs, a couple things to consider. First off, paint on the floor rarely lasts forever. You're going to have to just buy into the fact that there's going to be some chipping and traffic patterns and wear and all of that. You're just going to see it. Yeah, and sometimes that kind of works with the look. Even if you're going for like a shabby, chic design choice, then maybe it's not so bad. Maybe build it with that in mind. Yes, right? exactly. Shoot for that. That's how I'm going to do my whole house. <laughs> that way, if the kids, you know, mess anything up, mar it up, ding it up, it's, it's intentional. Shabby chic. Part of the look. It's, yep. yep, shabby chic. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to paint with my eyes closed. Yeah. So be aware of that. We don't want you disappointed. Another thing to consider is that coatings can fail. We talk about this all the time. If you don't do the proper prep, and that's really, really key on a floor, making sure you do the right prep work. And it starts with cleaning the floors really well really well. Yes. Uh, We'd recommend using Dawn dish soap, TSP, maybe a little Scotch-Brite scrubby pad, something to make sure you get them really, really cleaned and then rinse them well. Exactly. And then you really want to scuff the floors to promote that adhesion. We usually are talking about 180 grit sandpaper with a random orbital sander. You're just trying to scuff the surface. We're not trying to remove the varnish completely. Right. Something to keep in mind, if you choose down the road to use a water-based coating, good sanding is absolutely critical to getting good results. If you happen to choose an oil-based product... Not as important. Generally better adhesion, but still, it's good practice. Good practice. Now, after sanding, make sure you clean the floors again with a damp cloth. You're just trying to get the dust off. You don't have to break out the cleaners or anything like that. And one last thing when it comes to projects is just make sure you're planning that workflow so you don't trap yourself in a corner, <laughs> right? I did that I've on a deck. It. Oh, I, you have? I own... did it in a stairway. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That is really, really, really frustrating, and you feel really stupid because normally, while well, you're painting in your home, and you should know better, right. I was helping uh, my in-laws, and I was brought in because he's the expert. He knows. <laughs> and I'm on the deck, and I realized 
at one point, I am stuck here. <laughs> and then I said that. My father-in-law said, I wondered how long it was going to take you to figure out. He watched the oh whole thing. He saw it going down. It saw me happening. Yeah. Let it happen. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> don't do that. You want to look smarter than that. So plan it out ahead of time. Another thing to consider is that choosing the right paint products may require some expert advice. Yeah, if the floor is really worn already, if it's a knotty wood, if there are water stains present, these are all things that might affect our recommendations. Right, so come into the stores with photos, we can talk it through, we'll figure out what you're working with, and make a recommendation based on what you're comfortable working with product-wise as well. But we'll get you where you want to go. As for paint, like Haley just mentioned, some of it is going to be recommended based on your situation, Mm -hmm. but we can still talk about the main basic options out there. And from an oil-based standpoint, we'd recommend using Repcolite's urethane floor enamel. Wears really well. Extremely well, yeah. Yeah. I put it in my house. I had all these kids, and it held up like iron. So I'd really recommend that. And another option, if you want to go to water base, would be what? Benjamin Moore's floor and patio? I always say that wrong. Yes, floor did I get and patio. It right that time? You did actually. Wow, <laughs> Look at that. amazing star of the Porch show. Porch floor, no, it's floor <laughs> and patio, and it's a low luster finish, so a little bit less shiny. Okay, so there's the options out there. There's there's a few other things that we could recommend, but you're just going to want to have that conversation in the store. Any Repcolite or Port City Paints will help you get the right product. Now, the last thing to talk about before we move on to the really fun stuff is that the back to use time. You've got to keep that in mind before you. Really, yeah. really go crazy back in this room again. Ideally, you're waiting at least 24 hours before you've got any light foot traffic on the floors or putting any furniture back. And you're putting furniture back carefully after 24 Setting hours. Setting it down gently. And then dragging it to the other half <laughs> of the room, right? right? right. <laughs> no, be very careful with all of that. Give it time. And then generally a minimum of about a week before you put it back to normal use. Exactly. That's the work involved. Now let's get to the fun part with the time we've got left, and that's just exploring all the design options out there. Yeah, I mean, some of my favorite floors that I've seen on Pinterest and Instagram are kind of unexpected colors like soft yellows or pinks even, and there's so many options when it comes to stencils or rugs. I've seen flower patterns on floors that look gorgeous, but even just the classic checkerboard design with a white and subtle gray, you don't have to go super high contrast with the black and white, although that's still a fun look, too. Mm -hmm. When choosing a color, something to keep in mind is that colors on the floor typically look a couple shades lighter than colors on the wall. You know, all of the light is coming from above. A lot more is being reflected back up. So you're going to want to compensate for that by choosing a color that's a couple shades darker than you want. But before you just jump into that, of course, do some sampling. Yeah, you can either go with just the 8x8 architectural color chips we have in the store, so you're getting a little bit of a bigger view. Or if you're going to invest in a sample pint, not painting it on the floor now, we want to get a foam core board to paint that onto. And you really don't want to cheap out on this. Get a nice board. Don't paint both sides of it, just one side that's sealed. That way it doesn't start to warp on you. Right. Finally, dust and grime are inevitably going to collect. It's their way. And if you paint the floors in a super bright white, you're definitely going to see that more quickly. So try to aim for some mid-tone colors, and that way you're not going to see every little speck. Right. And I guess we should address whites because they're really popular right now. The farmhouse look is in. (laughs) So you're going to see these white floors everywhere. And I don't want to set people up for false expectations. I think it's a great color design-wise, just be aware that it's going to take some extra cleaning. I mean, right. you're not going to be able to have shoes in the house. Who doesn't love <laughs> extra cleaning and walking around in socks? Yeah. Just be aware. You're exactly right. It's a trendy color. You can definitely get there. We just want you to understand what you might be dealing with. Exactly. All right. That's all the time we've got. You can find this one again online at repcolite.com. And while you're there, make sure you subscribe to our podcast and you'll never miss another episode. Lots of inspiration for floors on Instagram, too. We'll have those in our stories and highlights. Check it out. And don't forget, if you do end up doing this project, we love to see that stuff. Tag us, Repcolite Paints. We want to see what you're working on. I want to see pictures. Exactly. We all do. Good pictures, right? Yeah. Yeah, Pictures of good products. If it really bombed out, tag another (laughs) company, right? (laughs) Anyway, all of the Repcolite stores are open, waiting to help. I'm Dan Hansen. I'm Dan Altino. And I'm Haley Johnson. Thanks for listening. 